Welcome to your lecture on culture. In this part, we're going to actually talk about norms, sanctions, things that are unique to culture, and things that are universal to all cultures. How do you know how to behave in any given situation? How do you know what to do and what not to do? When we're talking about norms, we're talking about things that are influenced by our value systems. So why is it on the first day of school you would walk into a classroom and you probably wouldn't walk up to me and give me a high five and say, what's up, Jess? What do we value that has you walk into our classrooms and say, good morning or hello to Mr. or Mrs. whoever? Well, we know that we value respect and that we believe that you should show respect to people in different positions and of different ages. Norms are essentially the rules, the expectations that we have that guide our behaviors. They can be rules about how not to behave and then also rules about how you should behave. The rules about what you should not do we'll call prescriptive. The ones about what you should do are prescriptive. Norms change over time. So here are three factors that you should consider. Anytime there is invention, the creation of new ideas, new objects, there's going to be changes and norms will change. Anytime we start to understand or know something better. So discovery. And finally, when we bump into other cultures and we start to get elements of their culture mixed in with ours. So if we look at invention, the creation of new cultural elements, objects and ideas, let's look at material culture. Let's look at the invention of the cell phone. How has that changed the rules about how we interact? How you ask someone out on a date? Whether or not it's okay to be on your phone at dinner time? Discovery, better understanding of something already known. Well, amazingly as it might be, Back in the 1920s, women weren't allowed to run marathons because they thought it would render a woman infertile. Well, cultural norms have changed. To see women working out and kicking butt, whether it's in mixed martial arts or CrossFit games, we know more, so the norms have changed. And then diffusion, cultural elements from one culture to another. We're not isolated anymore, so we are far more accepting of different ways of being and share our culture with other people. So we're not isolated and therefore we start to see other elements of other cultures mixed in with our own. It is important, however, to recognize that while cultures are unique, norms are also sometimes unique. And when traveling or interacting with people from other subcultures, it is important for you to understand how you may come across if you violate their norms. Here's just a couple of examples. In Thailand, public displays of affection between men and women, completely unacceptable. So if I'm walking down the street here in America, it's not going to be considered odd for me to hold my husband's hand or to give him a kiss on the cheek or to show any kind of affection to my husband. However, in Thailand, that would still be unacceptable. But men holding hands is considered a sign of friendship. In the United States, if you saw two men walking down the street holding hands, the natural inclination, the norm, would be to assume that they were in a romantic relationship. As a lefty, this is one of the ones that I just don't like. So knowing your left from your right. Well, in Morocco, Africa, and the Middle East, and in India, the left hand is still the idle hand or the devil's hand or the hand that you wipe your butt with. And so since these cultures definitely eat with their hands in usually a communal fashion, not always, but it's far more common, they expect everyone to eat their food with their right hand and that the left hand is for wiping butts. If you're left-handed like me, you could very easily slip into one of these cultures and just go with your dominant hand and really mess up. Everyone would think you're eating with your poop hand. Hissing. In America, we think direct eye contact, a firm handshake, uh, a, a nice compliment. That's how you show respect to your, sup or your superiors. In Japan, you hiss at them. Now, for me, that just still seems very strange, like an odd behavior, like hissing at my principal would be a very different way for me to show respect here in the United States. And in fact, she would take it the wrong way. But if I were in Japan, I might also find that to be very shocking to see people hiss at a superior, but because it's normal for them, there wouldn't be any kind of odd or weird feelings. 
Also, in places like Japan, it's incredibly normal for parents to hire an agency to do an investigation on the background of any potential marriage partners for a daughter. In the United States, I think the kind of biggest tradition we still sometimes hold to is the man asking the father's permission for his daughter's hand. And even that doesn't really happen that often anymore. And the too much food. In India, a guest indicates the generosity of the host by leaving so much food or leaving food on their plate because it indicates there was so much food they couldn't eat it all. In the United States, the cultural norm is actually different. The idea is that if you clean your plate, it indicates that the food was so good you had to eat every bite. It's a very kind of interesting thing. You could very much go to India intending to be very respectful and polite and stuff yourself and keep eating everything to show your host how much you like the food and what you would be doing is insulting them. There are three special types of norms that you guys need to know. The first one are called mores and sometimes people will say mores. Either pronunciation, pretty okay by me. They have a very significant delineation between what is morally correct and morally incorrect. They tend to be a very strong basis for our laws. The most extreme of the mores are going to be called taboos, and these come with really heavy social sanctions. If you violate a taboo, expect everyone in your society to treat you like a pariah. Expect them to treat you like you are the worst human being ever. So if you are looking at a taboo, a taboo would be something like incest. A taboo would be something like a first degree, premeditated, unprovoked, no justification homicide. In our society, if you just were to kill somebody because you wanted to, and there was no justification, and even worse, if it was a child or someone who was truly defenseless, our society would hate you. So that would be taboo. There's, there's no moral correctness at all. It is absolutely wrong. Folkways are the lesser of kind of the three when it comes to morality. It's the difference between really kind of normal and rude, not necessarily super moral, like absolute rights and wrongs. So the mother here smoking around her child. Well, we would sit there and look at that and go, that's probably not okay behavior. It's not healthy for the child, but no one's calling child protective services and having the child taken from the parent. Someone may come over and informally sanction the mother by going, you know how unhealthy that is, and maybe say something mean to her. But outside of that, she's not going to prison for smoking around a child. With all of that being said, don't smoke. Norms are controlled by laws and sanctions. Laws are formally defined and enforced sanctions that are a result of what a society deems is necessary. And often laws are going to be in reaction to mores and taboos. So, like I just said, mores are important sources for laws. Sanctions, however, are ways in which we control behavior, and they can be enforced by people in power, and we'll call those formal sanctions, or they can be enforced by everybody, and those are informal sanctions. Regardless, a sanction is there to try to press conformity. Formal sanctions can be good or bad rewards or punishments, but what they're trying to do is modify and control a behavior. So you do really good work at work and your boss offers you a raise. Well, that's a good formal sanction. You keep sleeping in and coming into work 20 minutes late and your boss docks your pay. Well, that's a punishment. But the linking thing on both of those is that for it to be a formal sanction, it's coming from your boss. Just like in a classroom, a teacher is the only one who has the power to provide a formal sanction. A student can't take extra credit and put it on another student's test or tell that student that they have to go to the principal's office. The other thing that we have are informal sanctions. And informal sanctions are rewards and punishments that can be applied by any member of a society. So someone tells a joke and everyone laughs. That's a positive formal sanction. That person will probably increase joke telling because they got rewarded by everyone's laughter. But let's say you hate that person or they're just really annoying and you get everyone to not laugh when they say a joke. 
well, you have officially got that person kind of punished. They're not going to continue to want to talk. And in fact, everybody knows how to control behavior by ignoring people. That's an informal sanction. If you're in an audience and someone does something spectacular on stage, you applaud. Formal or informal sanction, but a positive one. If someone does something bad in a game or on stage and you boo, again, that's an informal sanction, but it's a punishment. Sanctions are the responses we receive from others regarding our behavior. Like I just said, a smile or a frown, applause or laughter. But then we get into things like guilt and shame. Well, you've all felt guilty when no one else was around. A negative judgment we make about ourselves. So have you ever lied or took something that you weren't supposed to, even if it was small, and later you were sitting by yourself going, probably shouldn't have done that. I feel really guilty or told a secret to somebody that you weren't supposed to tell. And the person whose secret you were keeping never knows about it, but you feel this extreme sense of guilt. Nobody's there to make you feel guilty. You're questioning the norms of society and the value systems, and you're using them to base your judgment or your behavior off of that. And so you're feeling your own sense of guilt. Only cultural animals can experience guilt, but shame is different. Shame is applied to you by others. So if that person finds out that you told their secret and they walk up to you and say, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. You have that intense sense of shame. They disapprove of your actions. It's a, it's a being viewed by other people. So again, shame comes from the outside, guilt comes from the inside, but only animals or people, especially people, who have a knowledge of norms and desired behavior are able to feel that shame and that guilt. We have two different types of culture that we can talk about. One is called real culture and the other one's called ideal culture. Ideal culture is the story that we tell kids about how they should behave or what they should aspire to be or at my age when people talk about retirement and how your golden years should be. These are ideal. Real culture are the actual social patterns that are occurring within a society. So we look at something like till death do us part. And we tell people you should get married and you should marry that person and stay in this kind of happy, perfect Disney marriage for the rest of your life. And it should just be wonderful. And then we find out that while people get married, about a quarter of men and about a tenth of women end up cheating in their marriages. So the ideal of death do you part and being blissfully, happily married forever isn't necessarily accurate. Some people do, but real culture would look at divorce rates, when people cheat, all of those other things, and give us a more realistic picture of something like marriage. Technology is another aspect of culture. And when we talk about technology, we're looking at how we apply knowledge to our surroundings. The more complex a society's technology is, the more the members can shape the world for themselves. So what does that mean for you? Well, right now, we're in a perfect example of us shaping the world for ourselves. The government decided that we couldn't go back to school in person. So we're using technology to virtually create some semblance of an education. We're able to continue on something that 50 years ago, 30 years ago, would have never been possible. So we do see that as we get technology, our world changes and how we interact changes. When we talk about cultural diversity, it is important to note that the United States is very diverse. In fact, it's one of the more diverse industrial countries. But that doesn't mean that all industrial nations are going to be multicultural. Some, like Japan, are what we'd consider monocultural. They have very limited, if any, diversity within their nation. Diffusion, discovery, and invention have led to cultural change. Here in the United States, we went from the 1967 Loving v. Virginia case, where it had at that time been outlawed to have interracial marriages, to in 2010, the last U.S. Census, showing that 15% of marriages were between partners of different races and ethnicities. We start to have a change in the mindset about what it means to love and what it means to be married, and culturally, who it's okay to love and marry. And you guys, being a generation way past 2010, 
knowing that we have marriage for all, that's another one of those ideas that springs from this. Again, diffusion, discovery, and invention. Cultural lag, however, refers to the fact that some elements change at different rates, and some may actually disrupt cultural systems. When we talk about cultural lag, we're talking about folkways and mores. As things change, we hold on to the past and we try to reconcile the past with maybe what's going on in the current and the advances. And these different rates can have conflict between what we consider a more and what we consider a folkway. Sometimes they just don't always get along. So here's an example. We now have cell phones. Is it rude to interrupt a lunchtime conversation? in a restaurant to take a call on a cell phone. Having had this conversation with students before, the questions come up like, what kind of restaurant? Is it Chick-fil-A or is it a nicer restaurant with cloth napkins? Is the call from someone important or is the call from just a friend that you can talk to later? Is it okay to text or not okay to text? And again, we keep looking at this and we're not really sure where the rule applies. A long time ago, when you couldn't just pull a cell phone with you to your table, it was pretty rude to ever leave a table for a phone call. Diversity exists in some form in all societies, even those monocultural ones. And again, when we talk about diversity, even a monocultural society is going to have its own versions of diversity. And we'll have people that we'll put into different social categories. They carry some similar or common characteristic. Folk culture is going to be cultural patterns that are practiced by traditional groups, and they're often in isolation. High culture, well, those are cultural patterns that are distinguished by the elite of a society. And popular culture, you guys are going to be most familiar with this because this is what's widespread amongst a society's population. High culture and folk culture are not superior to popular culture, and really, they're just different ways of having cultural ideals. If we're going to talk about multiculturalism, it's important to also talk about subcultures. When we talk about a subculture, we're talking about a pattern that's distinguished from a society's overall more common culture. So you will have subcultures within the American culture. They involve not only differences, but also hierarchies. In the picture below, you see a group of punks from England. That would be a subculture. They're going to have their own norms, their own values, their own beliefs. and they may not always go hand in hand with the dominant culture. Counterculture is going to be very different though than a subculture. While a subculture may run counter to the mainstream culture in some ways, it still holds on to the traditional values and beliefs. However, counterculture is deliberately and consciously opposed to the central beliefs or attitudes of the dominant culture. In the two pictures that you have below, one is hippie culture, and that would have been, you know, people from the 1960s that were very anti-establishment, anti-government. However, the picture on the left is a gang. Um, that's MS-13 out of El Salvador. That subculture is technically a counterculture. They don't believe in the government. They have their own rules, their own norms. What they value is very contrary to the values of the larger culture. As cultures change, they try to strive and maintain a certain amount of cultural integration, a relationship among various elements of the cultural system. In 1969, people wanted to go to college and develop a meaningful philosophy of life. Due to things like the GI Bill, more people were going to college and moving away from family trades or having the jobs that their parents always had. But things that still remained relatively stable were the desire to raise a family. Anytime we talk about a multicultural society, subcultures, culture in general, we also have to have a conversation about ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is necessary for pride in a culture, thinking that your culture is good. So when we talk about ethnocentrism, it's the practice of judging another culture by the standards of your own. And like I just said, a certain amount of ethnocentrism is necessary for people to be emotionally attached to their way of life. But to assume that everyone thinks and acts the way that we do, well, that's just wrong. It can generate misunderstandings, it can generate confusion. It's really important in a sociological context for us to understand cultures within the context of the countries or in the groups of the people that form those cultures. Just like we would want them to understand our norms, traditions, behaviors 
in the context of our culture. Sociologists tend to try to discourage ethnocentrism because they're trying to research the societies as they are. And so they encourage cultural relativism, that something's only weird within a society if the society itself determines that behavior to be weird, that if the behavior is considered normal in a society, but not normal for the researcher, the researcher has to only judge that behavior by the standards that were created by the culture that it's investigating. So relativism, cultural relativism, you're judging the culture by its own standards. Additionally, there are things that are universal. We're not all different. Researchers have identified 70 different cultural universals, things like funeral rites and courtship, division of labor, sports. All of these things exist everywhere, in every society people are going to pass away and we have ways that we celebrate or mourn their loss. We have courtship, the pairing up of people. We have division of labor in different ways. We have things like sports and medicine. Those can be very universal, but how they're employed in every single culture becomes very particular. In the United States, we believe that you get married because you love somebody and you've investigated who they are and you found your partner, where in other cultures, they definitely have courtship rituals, except theirs might be that their parents arrange the meeting and the parents decide what they should do for that relationship. If we're looking at other particulars in the United States, it's tradition to wear white on your wedding day if you're a woman. But in China and India, well, the celebration color of choice isn't white. It's red. And again, there's still the idea that in a marriage or a courtship ceremony, there should be a large amount of celebration, usually a big festival or a feast or a party or something. And so that kind of tends to be universal. We celebrate these unions, but the particulars and the ways that we do celebrate them, well, those can become very specific. We account for cultural universals by the simple fact that we're all human. So the biological similarities that we have account for them. In every culture, children will be born, and therefore we have a family structure. People will become ill, and we need things like a medical system. And people are going to, like I said before, pass away, and you need some form of funeral rite. Physical environments require shelter. Shelters lead to settlements. Settlements lead to protection of the people within those groups. For cultures to survive, the new members must be taught the culture. And the cultures need to develop similar methods. So the people within the groups have to support and desire what's being taught, and they want to have to continue it on.